Uh, my name is Lynn Utesh, like it, as it was mentioned. And I live in Kewanee County, Wisconsin, where I farm 150 acres, uh, raising 100% grass-fed beef. So that's uh, uh, my wife, Nancy, and I have been doing this for close to well, over 25 years. So that's uh, we started farming, uh, grazing actually on Washington Island, which uh, we, we started up there. And it was basically because of necessity. Uh, Living on an island, uh, especially which is several miles out into Lake Michigan, we quickly realized you know, when we got back into farming that uh, raising corn and grain uh, in that environment really was not going to work for us, especially for raising beef cattle. That's uh, uh, we, we realized that that wasn't going to take place, so we started purchasing grains from off the island. Uh, I grew up under, under a conventional agricultural system. Uh, I dairy farmed with an uncle of mine, and so you know. I, I was under the impression that you always have to be giving a certain amount of grain to fatten those animals. Uh, it didn't really uh, didn't, didn't really work so well because when you have to actually import all of your grain, you quickly realize that it's going to cost a lot of money. So uh, we decided that we had to come up with a different plan for what we were going to do. Uh, and this was back before the idea of, of grass-fed beef or rotational grazing really had never been heard of. There was a, a little bit of research down at UW-Madison, which uh, was, was at the time was on the cutting edge of, of rotational grazing and gra grass feeding of, of our ruminant animals for both dairy and beef. So that's, uh, and so, you know, I had kind of heard some of that information and I had seen Alan Nation, uh, an editor of, of Stockman Grass Farmer, gave a presentation on this. And I thought, well, maybe we're going to have to try to do that. Uh, unfortunately, there was nobody else to give me any inf information. So we had to kind of invent what we did. That's, uh, it was, everything was by trial and error. Uh, a lot of error was involved. That's, uh, but we, we managed to, to set up a, a grazing system that really just from reading books and from, from a little bit of knowledge that, that I had from how we pastured our cows as a dairy. And, and we managed to, to, to progress to the point where we could actually uh, feed those animals on a year-round basis without any grains and, and make them very healthy. So that's, uh, we did this you know, up on Washington Island, like I said, out of necessity. Uh, we've after a few years, we lived there for 15 years, and uh, and I was supplementing my farming income by working, and my job was being eliminated. So we decided that we wanted to farm full time, and we moved to Kewanee County in 2004. At that point in time, our farm had been completely in row crops; it uh, hadn't been, you know, there was no fencing or anything like that. So we we had to install 150 acres worth of fencing and reestablish the grasses and the pasture at that time. So we planted a, a, a mix of clovers and some grasses uh, along with uh, some, some, uh, some oats and, and some rye just to, to get things started to, to begin with. And unfortunately what we realized was because it had been conventionally row cropped for so many years that uh, most of those things really didn't want to grow. That's, uh, so, so the first couple of years, we were really kind of wondering if we had made the wrong decision that uh, we planted everything the, the first year. And luckily we had had the stubble from the previous owner's uh, winter wheat crop there that the, the cows could eat off of. And some of the very overgrown areas that the, the, the for conventional farming they hadn't utilized. Uh, so they made it through the first year on that. And the next spring when things started to green up, there was like nothing coming up. and we were kind of kind of panicking that uh, you know maybe this stuff didn't work. Well, luckily the dandelions showed up. That's uh, and then we realized that then the clovers showed up, and then eventually we after the clovers were established, then then the 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 grasses started to come through. Uh, I was glad that we only had twelve cows on one hundred fifty acres because for the first year that's about all it, it could feed. That's uh, and part of you know like the, in this movie what we what you saw was that. You know, that soil needs to be living. And it was a, a quick lesson for me and my wife that, you know, living soils are something that we have to nurture, that you have to be able to, to you can't kill off the biology if you expect 
the farming system to actually function. So th as those clovers started to, to establish, they were feeding the soil microorganisms and they were starting to make the, the system start to work, which then made it so that it was possible for those grasses to grow. It was amazing to watch that as over the last 15 years, as we have, we've looked at what the changes in that system, as the soil comes back to life, the pastures come back to life, we continuously are getting new grasses in our pastures that we'd never planted. You know, it's amazing what you get. We also get livestock, or the, our livestock thrive, but we also get wildlife uh, and birds. You know, birds that have, haven't been around for, for years and years and years and aren't even, you know, expected to be seen in our area. We have prairie, prairie uh, birds that are out there. We have the meadowlarks that have come back and we have bobolinks that are not seen in any of the fields that are adjacent to our farm. It's, uh, so, you know, it's, it's been a, 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 a progression and it's, uh, and we, we need to, you know, keep working in that direction. So even as long as I've been doing this, what I realize is we're still nowhere close to where our soil should be and where the environment should be. So, and, and as we look at the soil, as I take a, a scoop of shovel, you know, I've had to replace a few fence posts here in the last couple of years. And, and as I'm digging down, we started out with deep clay, you know, deep red clay. You know, it was solid all the way through. There was no topsoil. Now, as I replace my fence posts, I've got eight to 10 inches of deep, dark, black loam that has been converted because of what the cows do and what those grasses do to, to that, that soil. It's just been amazing. You know, it's, uh, and as you, as, you, as you watched in the movie, all of that deep, dark loam is carbon. That is what we have sequestered. And it's actually helped the, 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 the soil to, to reestablish as being instead of dirt to actually being soil. And we really, you know, it's, it's a phenomenal thing to watch that that's, uh, as that takes place. And, you know, in the one thing, other thing with, with rotational grazing is, so, so I live in Kiwani County and, and we have 17 large dairy CAFOs, you know, the concentrated animal feeding operations. So, you know, we have a, a, a stark contrast that we can see very readily in our community between the conventional egg system and the rotational regenerative egg system, just by taking a look across the fence. You know, that's, uh, you know, the, on the industrial side, side of the fence, they're using manure from their animals, from their dairy cows, that is anaerobic. You know, it's, it's been sitting in a manure pit, it's liquid manure. Uh, when that manure is spread on the ground, you can actually see the earthworms are killed. They come to the surface, they're dead. Uh, there's, there's no dung beetles, which is nature's recyclers. There's no, nothing lives there besides like flies. You know, so you, you have all of these, the, this on an anaerobic side of the fence where you can see that the soil is being depleted. There's runoff, it's going into our rivers and streams. So you're, you can see that on the industrial side. And then on my side of the fence, you can see when we first moved here, we couldn't find an earthworm. There wasn't a worm on the farm. You know? And now you go out there and every, every inch is covered with, with worm castings. So, you know, everywhere you look, you can see the, these worms. So my cows, as they're out in the pasture, they're, they're, as their manure falls to the, to the grass, it's aerobic. It's, it's, so it's with oxygen. And that's how nature intended for, for that manure to be processed. Well, and that also allows that there is dung beetles. Those dung beetles, nature's recyclers, are taking that manure and putting it into the soil and building our healthy soils and feeding the grasses and feeding the pasture to make it even better for, for, the, for the future generations of that, that pasture. That's a, you know, so, so we're working with nature to make it so that, that we are improving what's going on. Uh, another thing with that manure is, so under, in a manure pit, you actually create additional methane and additional volatile organic compounds just because it's under anaerobic conditions without oxygen. Where, you know, so every time that that manure is spread, it, it just, it smells so bad 
It's, you know, it's, you, you can't, well, for me, having spent a lifetime in Wisconsin and in around farming, it doesn't even smell like manure anymore. Not the cow manure that I grew up with, where with our cows, you might get a little bit of smell as the cow is, is, is dropping its, its manure, but within minutes, there is no smell, there's no odor, there's no ammonia, there's no, not, none of the hydrogen sulfides, none of that is coming off of that manure, and anything that is, is actually being utilized by that grass that's there, because it's, it's aspirating it in and using it for, for nutrients for, for, the, for itself. So you know, we see a lot of these issues here in Kiwani County that you know, every one of them can easily be fixed by a simple change in how we're raising our animal agriculture and how we're processing and using those fields to make it so that it absorbs the, the, the nutrients and puts it directly back into, into the, 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 the cycle. You know, that's, that's the one thing that I continuously see. And it, I think, think it was really brought out well in the movie as well, is, you know, this is what we have to get back to. Is we need to get back to that nutrient cycling, which then increases the water cycling, which makes us so that everything is better for our environment. That's, uh, uh, our farm, you know, we're also in, incorporating native grasses. You know, as we see more extreme weather events, uh, you know, we went through a drought, drought here back a few years ago and I realized what we traditionally have in, in Wisconsin, all of our cool season grasses, which is what you, you plant, that, you know, that's not gonna be work enough for us in the future. Uh, we've already seen it, that, you know, we need to start incorporating more of our native grasses. And that's what we've done on our farm. We've started to incorporate, uh, especially what works well here is the big blue stem and Indian grass. Uh, you know, so we're starting to, to transition to more native grasses. And again, that's something that's going to work really well for climate change. You know, native grasses can have a 15 feet, feet of, of roots down into the soil. You know, they actually built the, the American, you know, the, our, our corn belt is former prairie. You know, those native grasses is what gave us that deep, deep uh, topsoil because of what those roots as they were, would be, uh, as the movie said, you know, as you, as the, the buffalo went through and, and ate off the top surface of the grasses, it, the roots slough off into the soil. And that, that then turns into that carbon, which is the organic matter, and it stores it there. And that's what turns into that, that rich topsoil. So, you know, we're trying to incorporate more of our native grasses into our prairie, into our pastures, and get more more into the the same similar situation as as the prairies were in the past but that's uh, uh i'll let john speak for a little bit and then hopefully there's lots and lots of questions thanks lynn that was wonderful john Okay. We just, oh, there yeah. You are. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, Lynn, that was a great um, introduction to how we can do this at the farmer level. So um, yeah, I, I can just add that. I mean, I'm a farmer myself. I've been, I grew up on a farm in Minnesota. I'm farm, I've been farming for five, six years now in Southern Dane County. So we do a lot of um, agroecology type soil sequestration work on my own farm. Um, and I also, for those who may not know, I, I work with Family Farm Defenders. So our, our organization was actually founded by dairy farmers in Wisconsin long ago. I mean, now we have 5,000 members all across the U.S. and other countries. I mean, we work on food sovereignty and, you know, climate justice and the whole transition to sort of a sustainable agroecological agro system as part of our agenda. I mean, that's been, we've been doing this work since the early 1990s. So, I mean, Lynn and Nancy with their farm are sort of in the legacy of founders of family farm defenders like John Kinsman, who was one of the pioneers of organic dairy farming in Wisconsin, Jim and Rebecca Goodman, who recently retired, they're on our board. I mean, these people have sort of led the way in terms of like, how do you transition from an industrial agricultural system to a more sustainable, climate-friendly Type of farming, and um, 
So what you know what we just heard was is a great example of how that would work. And um, I mean, I did share some resources in the chat, but as far as far as like you know how this actually plays out on the farm, I mean, you know, we only have about two million farmers left in the U.S. I mean, but like seventy percent of people in the U.S. actually do some gardening, backyard landscaping. So I mean, this is not just for farmers. This whole discussion. I mean, people can do this soil sequestration work in a lot of different ways. Um, and, you know, part of that is like, how do you, I mean, if we think about where, you know, the major carbon sink in the world is the ocean, but beyond that, we're talking about plants and soil. So um, if we want to really deal with the climate catastrophe that we're facing, I mean, we need to get greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere and into the soil. And that's one of the options we have. So if, you know, I, and then, you know, just for in the interest of full disclosure, I've been to the UN climate change conferences. I was in Copenhagen in 2009, where we first heard that, you know, 25% of all greenhouse gas emissions are coming from agriculture. And they're like going, whoa, what can the US do about that? And unfortunately, at that time, Vilsack, our current USDA secretary, back then he was under Obama, now he's under Biden, was basically saying, well, agriculture needs to do that, but how do we actually do that? So, I mean, this is one, I'm hoping we have this, can have this conversation about the film, but like, is that through, you know, manure digesters on factory farms? Is it through chemical intensive climate smart agriculture, which you just heard the USDA is putting a billion dollars into that? Or is it through what Linda described? I mean, you know, agroecological small scale, um, doesn't require synthetic fertilizers, pesticides to do type agriculture. So that, that's part of the whole discussion we're gonna hopefully have this evening. Um, I just wanna share some, I mean, he mentioned that, you know, virgin, the virgin prairie topsoils here, which we're all farming on now, had 10 to 15% organic matter. I mean, you're talking 60% carbon there. That's immense carbon sequestration happening in the Midwest. Put that under industrial agriculture with synthetic fertilizers and chemicals and continuous monoculture, you're down to less than 5%, 3% organic matter. So, I mean, that's what we're dealing with. We're basically destroying the soil, destroying our heritage to produce industrial commodities, and that's contributing to climate change. So that's, that's part of the, what the film talks about. Um, it's how can we get back to a more climate-friendly, eco-friendly agricultural system. Um, and I, I, I should really share too that, you know, part of this debate is like, you know, putting carbon in the soil is not just a climate change issue. I mean, part of that is like, we're trying to reduce our independence on imported fertilizers. I mean, this whole war with in Ukraine. So, I mean, we should not be relying on foreign fertilizer imports to support our agriculture. We can do that with our own biomass, our own carbon here. We don't need to be importing synthetic fertilizers to grow food here. We can do that here and that would help fix soil in the ground. I mean, Lynn mentioned about earthworms. When people ask me, what are the most important livestock on a farm? I say earthworms and pollinators. <laughs> Those are like the two most important livestock on your farm. Then you can add other animals, you know, cows, chickens. But if you really want to have a sustainable agricultural system, you'd have earthworms and pollinators to make it work. Uh, there's like your two base things, you know, which aren't even mammals or birds. So, I mean, so that's something to think about. Um, so when you talk about, you know, can you increase soil carbon in your soils. I put a bunch of links in the chat. I mean, the Land Stewardship Project has a great you know, pamphlet about how to do this as a farmer, but some things to think about, you know, each increase of 1% in soil carbon is gonna to lead to a, a decrease in over 700 to $1,000 of inputs you need to buy for fertilizers and, and so on for your crops. So, I mean, if you're a farmer, and I don't know how many farmers are on this call, but if you really want to like, try to, and I teach economics at Madison College, this is a full dis disclosure here. Um, if you wanna really do the cost benefit analysis, if you wanna make it as a farmer, 
don't buy inputs, have carbon in your soil and that will displace imported expensive inputs like synthetic fertilizers. So, I mean, that's something to think about. Um, every 1% increase in soil organic matter leads to 25,000 more gallons of water being held in the soil. I'll just mention that again. <laughs> For those who are worried about flooding in the Madison area, that's where every 1% increase in soil organic matter means that your soil can hold another 25,000 more gallons of water per acre. So, I mean, given the climate change chaos we're in and all these episodic heavy rain events and flooding and so on, switching to a soil farming, you know, let's support climate change friendly practices type thing is gonna really help at a lot of different levels. Um, so I just wanted to share some of that as a, and, and you can find more, more of these resources in the links in the chat I just shared, but I mean, it's not just about climate change, it's about making farmers more viable, it's about saving on inputs, it's about, you know, absorbing more soil, providing more nutrients for the crops you're, provide, you're selling and so on. I mean, I'm a vegetable farmer. I'm really, you know, I really care about the nutrient value of the organic crops I'm producing. And um, that's all part of this debate too. Um, as far as, um, and I'm hoping we have a really fruitful discussion a little bit. I did share some critiques of the movie in the chat. So um, some of the things to think about watching the movie, and I, I know many farmers in our group um, have written really strong critiques of this movie. One is, um, what is the role of the government in this process? So, I mean, the movie sort of talks about farmers taking initiative, you know, it's like an education problem, like farmers just need to know that this is important. Um, actually, our current industrial agricultural model, and Lynn sort of hinted at this, is not by accident. This was created by government policy. We have a cheap food policy in the US. We have a policy that encourages farmers to adopt synthetic fertilizers, fertilizers, pesticides, go into factory farming if you're a livestock producer. And that, that's part of the problem. I, I, I would argue, and I'm sure Lynn would agree with this, that, that this is like contributing to the climate change mess. Um, so, I mean, just so folks know, I mean, synthetic fertilizers are a huge contribution to the greenhouse gas climate change problem. Producing them, I mean, nitrous oxide alone is like hundreds of times more of a problem than carbon dioxide in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Um, the same thing goes for methane, which I mean, Lynn mentioned, you know, if you put manure in a, anaerobic conditions in a lagoon, you're gonna create massive amounts of methane, which is like 80 to 100 times worse than carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in terms of climate change. So how can we avoid that? You know, part of that, this challenge is like, we need, I would argue, we need to shift to a more agroecological, you know, eco-friendly, climate-friendly type of farming system. But if your government's not supporting that, that's gonna be part of the problem. So one of the critiques of the movie is like, the government is pushing this type of, anti-climate friendly system. So how do we shift the government away from that? And unfortunately, things like the growing climate, you know, there's legislation being pushed by USDA Secretary Vilsack and the Biden administration are to really pushing climate smart agriculture, which encourages more of the use of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides to do this type of, is that really a real solution? So I'm, hope, hoping, I'm hoping that's something we could talk about. I mean, one of the other issues in the film, um, and I wanna make sure we get have time for discussion here is, um, you know, are farmers the evil people or not? I mean, the film sort of presents like good versus bad farmers. I mean, I we have lots of farmers and family farm defenders. I mean, Lynn and Nancy are members of family farm defenders. I mean, we have other farmers who really don't have any choice. I mean, they've sort of been forced into this industrial agricultural model due to subsidies, due to all sorts of things. So how do we give them a good exit option? I mean, if they want to do this type of eco-friendly, climate-friendly farming, how do we make that possible? So I don't want to make this like, you know, farmers are stupid, farmers are bad. I mean, I was told this when I was in school, like, oh, you want to become a farmer? Well, that's a dumb job to have. Why don't you become a 
you know, tech person in computers. That's what I was told when I was in school. Um, so we don't want to discourage people from going into farming. We The whole idea is like, we want to encourage people to shift to a more eco-friendly, climate-friendly farming. So how do we do that? And so I, I want to make sure when people see this movie, they sort of provide this like farmers are either dumb or stupid. Well, that's not, I mean, you know, some farmers don't have a choice. So how do we make it possible that they can make a better choice? So I wanna make sure that we come out of the discussion of the film in that way. Um, and like the film shows like farmers doing the right thing, but there's a lot of farmers who don't have that choice to do the right thing. How did that happen? Um, one other thing to think about the movie is like, who's not in the movie? So um, <laughs> this is some of the critiques I posted. And this is one thing I wanna refer to. I, I've watched this film several times now. Um, and I keep thinking about this. And there's actually people who are involved in this film who sort of quit or resigned or out of protest because of what the final version of the film was. And that's partly because the people presenting the film, to be honest, I think are a lot of sort of stereotypical white farmer people. Um, so to be honest, I mean, I've done work in Zimbabwe. I've been to Zimbabwe. <laughs> I've done work in Zimbabwe for many years. Uh, to have Alan Savory go to Zimbabwe in the movie and sit on a safari chair with one of the film producers, like going, hello, there's people in Zimbabwe who have been doing this agroecological, climate-friendly agriculture for decades. I mean, I was there, I've seen it. And they're not white people. They're people from Zimbabwe who have done this work forever. So, um, since, you know, so that's one thing to think about is like, where are the indigenous voices? Where are the voices of people from the global south who have been doing this climate friendly agriculture for, for generations, for eons, and having given, been given credit for it? Um, how do we incorporate that and in, them into this discussion? So that, that's one thing I, I came from the film too. I was like, going, oh my gosh, having worked so much in the global south. With La Via Campesina and others. I was really hoping to see more of those voices in the film. Um, but I mean, we can talk about that. You know, where do we go from there? I mean, I know Lynn works with the Oneida. I mean, I work with folks from the Oneida Nation. I mean, there's a lot of indigenous folks in Wisconsin working on this climate friendly agriculture. You know, do they get credit? Do they have a voice in this conversation? How do they um, weigh into this? And one, one last thing I'll end, and then maybe we can have a discussion is like, how do we encourage farmers to do this? I mean, this is one thing the film sort of gets into a little bit, but not so much. Like, do we have to give them incentives? I mean, if agriculture is a big part of the climate change solution, how do we let family farmers and other people involved in forestry and so on get involved in this? Is it through privatized carbon trading markets? which is what the Biden administration is promoting through the Growing Climate Change Solutions Act, or, and I would argue the opposite. I mean, I think it should be a public investment project. I mean, we have existing USDA programs that will do this. The Conservation Reserve Program is a classic one, but you, do we give people carbon, you know, climate-friendly incentives through that program versus a privatized market. So, I mean, I, I was just watching today. I mean, I think Cargill just announced like, oh, we have 10 million acres of land we're going to put into the regenerative agriculture program under the USDA climate change solution. I'm going Cargill? I, I don't trust Cargill, <laughs> having been having been involved with family farmers for a long time. I mean, what do they mean by regenerative agriculture? How does that possible? General Mills just pledged this week, it's Earth Day week, right? I mean, this would make sense, that they're going to be doing a million acres of regenerative agriculture for carbon credits. Well, what does that mean? How do family farmers benefit from that? Is it real? Is it just another, you know, I don't know, sort of, you know, scheme behind the scenes. Like, what, what's, what's going on with that? So, I mean, that, that, that's something that we can, we can talk more about. Like, how do, how do farmers get benefits for doing this? Indigenous people, other people have been doing this forever. 
versus just a corporation speculative, you know, Bitcoin crypto operation. So that that's a good conversation topic. So I think I'll end there and we'll open up to questions. So wonderful. Thanks, thank you. Thank you so much, John. And again, Lynn, for sharing your not only your experiences, but um, also some really powerful uh, reflections, um, really helpful framing to think about uh, this set of issues and some very thought provoking questions that John has already fielded. Um, so in order to ask a question, you can do it one of two ways. You can ask it yourself um, by um, clicking, going to the bottom of your screen to the reactions button and clicking raise your hand so I can see, see you. And then I will call on you, ask you to turn on your camera and then ask you to unmute so you can um, ask our panelists yourself or you're more than welcome to type your question into the chat and I can read it out uh, for Lynn and John. And, and we'll take some questions in batches of two or three. Um, uh, so, it, you know, please don't be shy. So I already see Alfonso has a question. Alfonso, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm glad John already actually brought up some of the questions that I had, but related to that, he also talked about how uh, policymakers can be influential in, in these decisions. And uh, I was wondering what, what uh, if any initiatives are out there to not only continue educating farmers as in the film Archuleta was doing, uh, you know, initiatives like that around Wisconsin and elsewhere, but also about legislators. And because to me, you know, the, even though there are problems with the film, uh, it's still very powerful. Uh, I think the message gets across that, that, that we have an issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, and yet, Oh, I realized that I didn't have my camera on. I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, my concern is, you know, it's about our legislators. Uh, and, and, you know, we have these lopsided legislatures all over the country uh, that are having a very negative impact on many issues. And, and I, you know, I, I am to assume not knowing and not being an expert in this that it is also having an impact in our agricultural efforts in, in, in our state. Uh, but, uh, you know, many of them do present themselves as farmer friendly. And if they're farmer friendly and they understand these issues, um, I would assume that they would do something to support efforts like, you know, like what John was saying that, that need to be supported, uh, like what, uh, Lynn is doing, and I, I you know, I, I don't know if that there are any, but I, it would be interesting to know if there are educational campaigns to work with our, our legislators specifically to have them and help them propose specific bills that would garner the bipartisan support because we're talking about an issue that affects both left and right. And so I'm, I'm interested in that, if you can perhaps add to it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alfonso. You're welcome. Great. We next. Oh, the problem with Zoom today in America. So we next have a oh, thank you, everyone. Uh, next, we have a comment from Norma who who uh, posted to the chat. Uh, Norma writes: the solution to the world problem is to end profit for all that for all for us all to control production by us for all of us. And that means uh, working to get electeds that forward that work to end profit. So Norma, thank you very much for um, that uh, very insightful critique um, on political economy. Uh, we appreciate it. And then Greg writes, um, and then I'll, I'll kick it over to you both uh, Lynn and John. Greg writes, I've heard that regenerative farming might be able to sequester a significant portion of current CO2 emissions, perhaps 50% or maybe even more. Do you have any idea quantitatively of what that potential might be? So we'll leave it there and then I'll take Judy's, um, 
Judy's comment and question after that. So Lynn and John. Well, I can comment uh, legislatively, you know, I think the, the biggest issue that we're having right now is the, our legislators say that they are farm friendly and what they don't really say is it's not farm friendly, it's agribusiness friendly. They are very uh, in tune to what agribusiness, and unfortunately, a lot of those agribusinesses are the people that feed off of the farmers and make it so farmers can't survive. That's they're very happy to keep those people ha happy. That's a, that's where their that's where the donations are coming from. There, there's very few farmers that are you know small family farms that are making large donations to legislatures to actually be able to influence what they're, what they're, how they're voting. That's uh, here in Kiwani County, we see it continuously. You know, that's uh, the, the legislative people are very, very much uh, pro big farm uh, because that's where, that's where the po political power is. You know, Wisconsin Dairy Business Association, uh, Farm Bureau, you know, those are organizations that are pro agribusiness. And that's the where, you know, the, the legislative looks for their answers. Unfortunately, they're not going in this direction because those agribusiness, they need, they, they make money off of farmers and they don't want to change it. You know, the system that, that John and I are talking about with, the, you know, even the movies talking about, that's making money for a farmer. You know, that's, that's putting, this, what I do is I put all of my farm resources go directly back into my family and my business that that's, uh, and actually into my community. Because if I don't have to purchase something from outside of the, the community, my dollars stay right here in my community and circulate around and support our local, local businesses. Uh, and I think the other thing is, you know, there's a huge, huge from the climate change perspective, uh, you know, everybody wants technology. You know, it's like manure digesters. Manure digesters are supposedly going to cure the, you know, the, all of the problems of the world. You know, well, you know, what goes into a digester comes out of a digester, uh, so it doesn't actually fix anything in our community, especially in a community like mine. We already have seven digesters here. It, and we're still the most polluted county in the state for a groundwater practice. Well, that's a so you've got digesters don't fix things because you're again you're creating more more greenhouse gases by that process than just by letting those cows out of the barn, you know. So you know, and that's what is being promoted all the way up to the Biden administration is is those types of things is technology is what they think is gonna get us out of this instead of what nature, you know, we didn't have this problem till we came along. You know, we're the ones that are burning the carbon. We're the ones that are farming that are burning, you know, releasing it from, from our soil. So, you know, nature had this fixed a long time ago. We just gotta get back there to, to allow nature to, to fix it. So I'll let John comment on. Yeah, I mean, th those, are, uh, those are good points, Lynn, about, I mean, sort of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure when it comes to climate change. So like, why do we want to be, I mean, our, our organization, Family Farm Defenders is totally opposed to pollution trading, for instance. I mean, why should we, I mean, I teach economics just, I mean, I already think I already mentioned this, but you know, part of the problem in economics is like, if we have pollution, it's a negative. It's, it's not a good, it's an ill. We, you know, we're trying to provide goods and services, not ills and disservices. So. If pollution is an ill, we don't want pollution, but if we're gonna privatize pollution and make it a commodity, then people are actually gonna go about making it and then trying to find a way to you know, get money from reducing it. So like you know, Lynn mentioned, I mean, we literally have manure digesters in Wisconsin right now being used to offset carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel plants in California. So, I mean, that did not help the atmosphere one iota. I mean, we're still emitting pollution. We're just moving it around. So, and, and, and the result is like, we're having contaminated groundwater and Lake Michigan beaches we can't even walk on 
thanks to factory from manure runoff from you know manure digesters that don't work. And then in California, they're having more you know asthma problems. So I mean that that's not you know that's not a solution to the climate change problem. So I mean when it comes to like we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through agriculture, the whole idea is we should have a net reduction, not a moving of pollution around, which is one of the problems with the whole Biden administration Vilsack proposal with the Growing Climate you know, Solutions Act is like, oh, we're just gonna pay farmers to like reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 10% using glyphosate and synthetic fertilizers in a different no-till operation when the real solution should be you know, incentivizing farmers like Lynn to do rotational grazing, get cows off onto grass away from a factory farm model, not having farmers producing you know, continuous corn soybean rotations but you know that that's part of the whole the whole problem is like it's sort of a you know i swallowed the fighter to swallow the spider to catch the fly like we're we're like chasing our our tail to try to solve this problem so um we, if we want real solutions i mean I, you know i would argue we need to in terms of legislation we need to actually think about the farm bill i mean the farm bill the whole idea of the farm bill is to you know Try to move U.S. agriculture in the wrong, in the right direction, not the wrong direction. So, what the right direction would be: like we need to transition to a low-input agroecological system that incentivizes farmers to do things like Lynn's doing, rotational grazing, you know, bi biodiverse farming operations, like I do on my farm. You know, incorporating trees and and other things into their farming systems, not doing industrial corn, soybeans, round the clock, 24 seven for 100 years. Um, and, you know, if, and, and in that system, we can do that through existing taxpayer programs. We can do that through the conservation reserve program. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to create a totally corporatized, privatized carbon trading market that's run by Cargill or big data operations. That's why I'm really worried about, you know, because they, they're going to be controlling who is allowed to be part of this system and so on, and who's, you know, evaluated and approved to get these credits. Um, let farmers do it through a taxpayer's. I mean, this, the climate change is a public public problem. We should have a public solution, and that involves taxpayer efforts to to incentivize people to do that. So. I mean, that, that's one of the you know, shortcomings, I think, in the film is like, where is the public policy element to this? I mean, this didn't just happen by mistake. This, this mess didn't just come out of the fall of the sky. I mean, we need to totally shift our agricultural system to a different process. And you know, one, one, of the, you know, one thing to think about too is that most people in the world who are being fed right now are being fed by women of color in the global south. Is not a white guy in a tractor in North Dakota growing wheat that's feeding the world. The U.S. is a food deficit nation, just so people know that. We're importing more food than we export. We have more prisoners in this country than farmers. We are not the world food leader anymore. And the, the Ukrainian-Russian conflict shows that. I mean, we, we need to think about if you want, you want a food sovereignty policy, then we should be promoting each country growing food that's climate friendly, ecologically sustainable for their own needs and you only export your surplus. And that's how we're really, I mean, I, you know, small farmers can feed the world and cool the planet. That, that's the slogan of Via Campesina, which we're part of. And that, that's what, that should be our food policy as a country. It should not be like, oh, we're gonna have the cheapest food possible and however, however we have to do that is the way to go. That, that's, that's gonna be a climate disaster. Thank you both. Uh, Judy writes, um, thanks for this opportunity to learn about soil, something I knew very little about, as well as the benefits of regenerative agriculture. I was struck by one sentence in the film. This, Judy, also horrified me as well. We have 60 harvests left mm -hmm. unless we adopt this method of creating new soil. Uh, Judy asks, are there any legislators in Wisconsin who are farmers and are promoting this type of farming or uh, supportive of your efforts. And then let me see, I need to scroll down a little bit um, further. Oh, and, and Nikki writes, 
uh, which country exports more food than the US? Uh, John, if you happen to know that, that would be great. And then Patrick Barrett, I will take your question as well before I hand it back over to John and Lynn. Do you have any response, Lynn? <laughs> For any of them? Are we, are we ready or do, do we have that yes, question so coming? You go ahead, <laughs> Lynn, why don't you go ahead and respond? We'll let Patrick wait, so please. Well, uh, you know, for the question about or about uh, where do we export, I'm not really sure which country exports more, but I do know that, uh, you know, not too long ago, there was a study that showed that Iowa, that is so called the, the uh, you know, right there in the corn belt, the breadbasket of the, the U.S., they can't even feed themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, if you look at it, if you go to the grocery store for human food, I think this is what people have to understand is, all those fields that you see out there, that's not human food. That's not food for people. That's food for cows. That's food for pigs. That's, you know, it's food for chickens or it's food for industrial systems, uh, you know, for manufacturing, but that is not human food. You know, so if, you know, the, the one thing is if we shifted to, put, well, one, corn, corn and soybeans, uh, we're not intended to be fed to a cow, you know, especially corn. Corn genetically comes from South America. You know, cows did not exist in South America until we brought them there as white settlers. You know, so genetically speaking, corn should never be fed to a cow. You know, it would never in nature ever come together. So, you know, and that's the problem is, you know, like for red meat, you see a lot of these issues. So we are actually feeding something to a cow, which could be for a human, it would be like feeding everybody Snickers bars. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so now we're here feeding a, this cow Snickers bars and now we expect people to be healthy and the environment to be healthy. It's, it just doesn't work. You know, the grass fed cattle, 100% grass fed, they have are actually a healthy product for people because they're very high in omega-3 fatty acids with good fats, you know, what everybody talks about. They're very high in CLA, conjunctive linoleic acid, which was actually, that research was done by the University of Wisconsin in Madison. You know, this is what, you know, we found, we know these things about the, you know, letting animals and letting nature work makes it a healthier product, not only for the environment, but also for us as the eaters of all of these products that we have. So, you know, that's a, the, we, we don't, the United States doesn't feed itself. The, mm -hmm. That's a, the plain and simple truth. 70% uh, of the world is fed by small family farmers uh, and mostly women, just like John said. So the United States only present, produces 30% of the world's food. And that's, and we actually have create more destruction by that because of all of the use of our pesticides and insecticides and our heavily fuel uh, reliant agricultural system that we have. So, you know, that's, I think that's the, the big thing is, you know, we're not the ones feeding the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, those are, that's great response, Lynn. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, I mean, just so people know, I mean, I don't know if people are aware of this, but in Wisconsin, we import 90% of our food. So, I mean, we think we're an agricultural state, but most of the food we actually eat here is not edible. I mean, we, we, we're producing, like you mentioned, a lot of soy and, cor you know, soy and corn that we can't actually eat. So, I mean, this is always a shocking one. We have foreign, you know, visitors from other countries come here and I drive them around. We're like driving through all these corn and soybean fields and I go, well, none of this you can actually eat as a person. Here, livestock feed that's going to do an animal somewhere or a high fructose corn syrup factory or a factory farm ethanol plant. So, I mean, this is not, you know, actually human food. So we, you know, the U S is importing 20 to 30% of our fruits and vegetables. Yeah. I mean, maybe we dump a lot of corn and soy on the foreign markets, but I mean, a lot of it's not actually not something people can eat, which the Mexicans found out long ago when we had our ethanol boom in the U.S. and suddenly they got cut off from their cheap corn imports and they didn't 
realize that, I mean, this corn could be made used for, for, for tortillas anyways, and it sold it back to us as high fructose corn, corn syrup. But I mean, that's how global trade works, right? So, I mean, we have a lot of corporate agribusiness, you know, companies like Cargill, ADM, so on, that, that make business on this trade. But I mean, only 10% of the world's food is traded, by the way. I mean, I'll just repeat that. Only about 10% of the world's food production actually crosses a border. So, I mean, most of the world's food is produced and consumed within the countries where it's produced. So, I mean, the whole idea like the U.S. is feeding the world. Yeah, we're, we're sort of the tail that wags the dog. I mean, we set all the food prices in Chicago at the Board of Trade, but that's not really, I mean, yes. I mean, what happens in the U.S. does affect farmers in Brazil or consumers in Indonesia, but it's not. I mean, it's not like we're controlling the world food market. So, I mean, that's, that's just something to think about. Like, you know, mo a lot of the food in the world is actually produced and consumed by people on their own farms. So, and then within their own bioregion. So, but yeah, I mean, this is this is a big, I mean, and, 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 you know, to emphasize the point about the soil, I mean, soil, healthy soil equals healthy food. So if you're treating soil like dirt, which is what the industrial agricultural system does, I mean, it basically treats it as a medium. Right? We're going to dump synthetic fertilizers in it. We're going to dump pesticides into it. And we're going to hope to grow, have a higher you know, yield. You know, who cares about the nutrition value of that? Or whatever? But we're going to have a higher yield coming out of it. Um, is that really going to help feed the world? I mean, that, that, that's a big question. I mean, and, and there's been tons of studies done about how the nutritional quality of food has gone down over time. I mean, that's why people like heirloom tomatoes versus the rubber balls you buy at the store. I mean, that, that's, it, we, we've had, we're having a dumbing down of the whole food system, right? And then we go back later and said, oh, well, we can add nutrients to it. We can put vitamin D in the milk. We can, you know, try to make up for the difference. Take a mo another multivitamin pill to, for your food to, to problems. But I mean, that, that's not, I mean, if you want to really have a healthy food system, the whole thing starts with the soil, right? And it, you know, having you know, healthy soil leads to better, more nutritious food, helps the climate. And you know, I would argue, I mean, it's, it's just, it's part of the whole bioregional, I mean, we call it agriculture for a reason, right? I mean, it's the whole relationship between people and the environment, it's healthy. It's not an agribusiness model. The whole goal is not profit. The goal is a healthy relationship that provides nutrition. I mean, what, why do we eat food? <laughs> it's, it's, it's because it's yummy. It's because it's nutritious. It's not because it's cheap, convenient, and fast. I mean, if you're eating food because it's cheap, convenient, and fast, you have a there's a challenge, there's a problem there. And that's going to lead to a problem for the climate, for the earth, for the soil, for the environment, everybody. Thanks, John. I do want to I want to make sure that Judy's question doesn't get lost, um, but I will take uh, Patrick in one moment. So a reminder. Um, Judy asked if there are any of our current legislators in the state that happen to be farmers and whether or not they are actually um, pursuing legislation or any sort of policy that might actually assist uh, family farmers. But now I will ask Patrick Barrett to come in to ask his question. So Patrick, go for it. Thanks, Adrian, and thanks, John and Lynn. This is really fantastic. So I, I've got a two-part question. Um, so one has to do with family farm defenders. So you mentioned that there, you know, you've got a large number of farmers who are members. Is it possible for non-farmers to be members of family farm defenders? And the second part related to that, I guess, is are there other organizations, whether for farmers or non-farmers, to get involved? I mean, where would you send people? To really sort of be part of an organized organized effort to address the both the problems and the solutions that you've been advocating. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Patrick. So, I mean, to respond to Judy's question, I mean, we don't, as far as I know, I don't think we have any farmers who are elected politicians from Wisconsin, say, to Congress. I mean, the best person we've worked with is Mark Pocan. Um, who's a personal friend of mine. Um, but I mean, he's, for instance, really concerned about, say, country of origin labeling. So, I mean, this is one of the big issues with the farm bill. Like if people want to, are concerned about the carbon impact of their food, 
we should be able to know where our food comes from. So when you go to the store, you should be able to pick up a package and go, whoa, this hamburger is from Argentina. That's a problem. Um, why can't I find Wisconsin or even US hamburger at my store? So, I mean, that, that's like something which, I mean, 60 countries have country of origin labeling. The US does not. And to be honest, the Obama administration jettisoned this when the Mexico filed a WTO complaint. So, I mean, we need to, we need to bring that back. Like, I, I, I would argue we need a country of origin labeling for everything. I mean, as a consumer, I think I have the right to know when I go to the store where every, everything I buy comes from, not just the t-shirt I'm wearing right now, which has a label on it <laughs> about where it was made, um, but I should have that right for food, whether, whether it's dairy, meat, you know, fruit, whatever. Um, so, I mean, Mark Pocan is a really good advocate for that type of work um, in our state. And, you know, as far as like, you know, family farm. Yes, you don't have to be a farmer to be a member of family farm defenders. The majority of our members are farmers, but you know, anyone's welcome to join. You don't have to pay money to join. You can just like, hey, I want to be a member, and we'll send you a newsletter. But I mean, the whole idea is like, you should be supporting food sovereignty principles, which is what we've sort of been talking about. You know, the right of, you know, food is a human right. Food should not be used as a weapon. People have the right of local democratic control over their food system. Those are all food sovereignty principles. So you can look those up you know, on our website or through Via Campesina. But I mean, that's sort of our, you know, a lot of people always question us like, well, John, we know what, you, what you're against. What are you for? And I go, well, we're for a food sovereignty system. So, I mean, that, that includes you know, things like climate justice. So, I mean, that, that's part of what this film is about. Like, how do we bring about climate justice? And you know, food sovereignty and agroecology would make that possible. So, it's uh, I can uh, say that we do have a uh, legislator that is uh, a farmer here in the state of Wisconsin, and that's Gary Talkin. Uh, unfortunately, he he probably doesn't believe in much of anything that we've been talking about. Uh, he's more <laughs> on the industrial side of things. Uh, it's a uh, and a, a big dairy farmer. So I would not say that he would be on our side. Uh, I think the other, there's another here in the state of Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Farmers Union is probably the, the as a another farm organization is probably another organization that would be more on this, the willing to understand and talks about and supports this type of agriculture. Uh, they're, they're very much in, in support of organics and uh, rotational grazing. So that would be, be another organization and they they you could be a part of that without being a farmer as well mm -hmm. yeah I, i'm a member myself so i mean you can be members of multiple groups and yeah that's a great group to be part of too so thanks so much um angie uh, if you would like to unmute yourself we'll take your question yeah maybe this was said by one of you very fast and i didn't pick it up or it was in the film but I was wondering on a global scale uh, and, and thinking about climate change, what would be the tipping point of going back to um, soil regeneration, regenerativeness that would start turn making the impact to turn climate change back around? Like what percentage of the earth's soil would be a good thing that we should aim for. Thank you, Angie, for that question. Uh, John or Lynn, do you guys want to uh, take that? I, I, I think yeah. in the go ahead, go John. Ahead. Go ahead, Lynn. Yeah. <laughs> I I think in the movie it was like a, a one percent increase in soil organic matter. That's a, you know, that's going to have a huge amount of, of carbon that would be sequestered to come to that. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, that means a lot of farmers are going to have to start to do things a lot differently than what they are right now. Uh, you know, that's, you know, we, we even have, you know, a lot of, a lot of, you know, in my area, they talk a lot about uh, cover crops. Well, you know, here in the state of Wisconsin, cover crop is putting in seeds in the ground in November and December. That's not going to be what's going to work for actually changing that that soil organic matter. That's that's a good PR move by by a lot of uh, industrial farmers, but unfortunately, it's not like what Gabe Brown did in, in the movie. You know, you need to be 
planting those those cover crops so that by freeze up there, you know, a minimum of a six to eight inches tall, you know, with multiple species and things like that. So it's, you know, we need to really get farmers on board to to really start to, that change. So it's, uh, and that's globally, you know, it's not just here, it's, it's all over the world. Yeah, I mean, I could just add that. I mean, one of the big challenges is like the intensive, you know, soy corn rotation type system we have in the US is not gonna be solving this problem. We need to get to more perennial long-term, you know, systems like what, you know, what Lynn and Nancy are doing with, you know, you know, pasture for multiple years. I mean, if you look at prairie grass, imagine, you know, the height of the prairie grass, multiply that by three or four. I mean, that's what's not happening underground. And that's where the carbon's being fixed. So, I mean, the same thing, same thing with the tree. So, I mean, if you look at like agroforestry systems where you're combining trees with agriculture, silvopastoral systems where you're combining trees with livestock. I mean, that, that's where we're gonna be really fixing a lot of carbon. And, um, you know, the whole idea like, oh, you know, tomorrow Monsanto and, you know, Bayer are going to like sign up with Cargill and we're going to get a bunch of farmers to switch to some no-till system using glyphosate. That is not going to solve the climate change problem. I mean, that could be, that could be a race in a year. And, you know, more than one of my big concerns is like, we're actually encouraging now, you know, with the whole current food fertilizer crisis with the Ukraine-Russian war, is we're trying to encourage farmers to take land out of CRP, out of the Conservation Reserve Program, and put it back into agriculture. And they're gonna be growing corn and soybeans. I mean, that's like a totally anti-climate change solution. I mean, they should not be doing that. We should be encouraging more farmers to shift to a more permanent type of sustainable system over time. And that, you know, that, and to, you know, this should be true in the global South too. I mean, I mean I'm involved with a, whole anti-land grabbing campaigning, you know, we're trying to stop companies, you know, pension funds like TIA, which unfortunately my pension funds in as a Madison College professor, I have no choice about this, but they're like using my money right now to gobble up farmland in Brazil and turn that into industrial agriculture, chopping down the rainforest. I mean, that type of process should stop. I mean, we should not be having a net carbon loss you know, for agriculture. I mean, you know, it's like we, we talk about net, you know, we should not, not have a net wetland loss in terms of water quality. We should, we should not have, we should not be advocating any agricultural practices that lead to more climate change emissions, period. You know, no more factory farms, no more conversion of tropical rainforest or temperate rainforest or whatever into agriculture. You know, we should be just shifting out of, you know, industrial monoculture soy and corn bean production into more diversified crops, um, you know, promoting agroforestry. I mean, there's a whole thing we could, we could, should be doing that transition. And I, I'm just worried that unfortunately with, you know, the current Biden Vilsack administration, we're just going to go for the short, quick, high tech fix, which is like throw some money at Cargill. They'll certify a bunch of their land as regenerative. They'll get carbon credits for it and everything's hunky dory. That, that's not going to work. That is not going to be the solution. We need to, you know, we should have more farms in the US, not less. We should be changing our agricultural system to growing human food, not livestock, factory farm, ethanol, high fructose corn syrup food. And, you know, that, and we should be encouraging that trend all around the world. That, that's what we should be doing. Oh, thank you very much, John. I will um, exercise my power as facilitator to, uh, to ask my question. So I was uh, really struck uh, by the fact that you both have uh, talked about the constraints under which uh, U.S. farmers um, are placed, right? We, um, they have to operate within a system of relationships that we understand is known to be capitalism. So Um, I think that that is an unuseful uh, framing, um, but they are in fact driven to potentially feed their families, uh, clothe, house them, that sort of thing. And so I'm really struck um, by what you said about um, incentivizing, I would say supporting farmers to, um, you know, undertake the transition. And I'm curious, uh, the transition from, um, a techno-based 
conventional farming method to one that actually um, I'm going to call more traditional because I feel as though it is returning to nature in a way. And, and that contrasts very deeply to me with the, the technological innovation that seems to be de rigueur right now. Um, but I want to know from you, uh, Lynn, you have this experience, I think, personally, and John, you might know, um, you know, because of your work with um, Family Farm Defenders, what, what is that cost? Um, what, what risk are U.S. farmers looking at when they're, when they're trying to make this evaluation? And so, therefore, how do we as um, individuals who are, and, and communities that are concerned about this, how, how might we then place pressure on, um, on electeds and others to encourage the use of taxpayer dollars to actually support this transition rather than use those dollars towards the subsidies that go to these large agribusinesses? Well, I guess from my experience, one, I think what you really need to start with is, uh, you know, most farmers right now are renting land from, you know, other non-farmers. So that's, uh, I think the, the one, one of the fastest ways that we could change this system is if we could get those landowners, and a lot of them uh, have are not have no clue what farming is. I think that's one of the biggest problems for these landowners. I think what you know, if we could get landowners to dictate how their land is being used, and to make sure that it's being used in a in a ecologically and environmentally friendly way. You know, it's in my area. I see this all the time. Is you know, we've got huge industrial farms here and they own very little land yet they dictate how that land is being used so you know if we could get the landowners to start saying uh you know for like i said in my community we have problems with liquid manure you know you can't put on twenty six thousand gallons per acre of liquid manure you have to do something less than that uh same thing you can't put in corn every single year you know you need to you know we you know, there's research out there that shows a seven year rotation is, is far better for the farmer and far better for the soil and far better for all of us. You know, put in a different type of rotation. John's kind of said that, you know, I think if landowners start to dictate some of those things, you're gonna see a change in our agricultural system quite quickly. That's, uh, it's, you know, the land, if you don't have land, you don't get a farm. So that's kind of what it comes down to. And again, that's, that's something else that could be done is, you know, we've got it. I, I talked to a lot of young people that would love to be farming in a better way, yet they have no access to land, you know? And unfortunately, a lot of these landowners, they, they live in the cities, they own this land and all they want is a profit as well. So, you know, if we could get some of those city landowners to start looking at renting to young people, just to cover their taxes, you know, just to make it so that these young people can get started in farming and not take the highest dollar from the, the biggest industrial guy in the, in the neighborhood, that's going to be a good way to, to start promoting this. And that is something that government can promote is, you know, we want more farmers on the land. So mm -hmm. yep. the, as, as we keep losing farmers, they get bigger and bigger and more industrial. So that's, uh, you know, and, and every cornfield that you see that has bare ground, you are right there. Every one of those fields is creating climate disaster. Nature hates a bare field. That, <laughs> that, that ground, that soil in between there, uh, you know, especially here in Wisconsin, a lot, of, a lot of dairy farming and a lot of those corn acres, especially, they go for silage. They don't need to have bare ground in between there. You know, all they're doing is cutting it, cutting that corn off, chopping it up into pieces and throwing it into a silage pile. And, and I won't explain all how that all works, but, you know, they could have every single one of those, those weeds growing in there. And the fact is the neat weeds are more nutritious than that corn is. So their cows would actually be doing better. So, you know, bare ground is, is another thing that we need to get away from. Mm -hmm. And I'll let John chime in on this one <laughs> yeah no that, that those are great comments i mean a lot of people don't yeah half of farmers in the u.s don't own their land 
So, I mean, this whole idea like, oh, all these farmers own their land and they're like, no, they're, a lot of them are modern day serfs. I mean, they, there's some absentee landlord that's controlling them. And, you know, this also extends to contracts. I mean, a lot of people are under contract. They don't have any say about what they're doing on their land. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the whole idea of like, you know, giving land back to the tiller. I mean, that's a, that's a food sovereignty principle. I mean, those who are farming the land should actually have control or something to say about the land, not just some absentee landlord in Miami or Hong Kong or wherever they are. Um, so, I mean, that that's a big problem in this country. And when a lot of people ask me, which country in the world needs the land reform the most? I'm going, well, South Africa, yeah, Brazil, yeah. No, US, US needs land reform the most. You know, and we, we, we need more young farmers, more diverse farmers. I mean, we're having the largest transition in land ownership is happening right now in the US. All these baby boomers are leaving us. I mean, my parents are in this category, right? Do I inherit their farm or not? Or does a bank get it? Or a frack sand mine? Or a pension fund? Who's going to control that land? You know, and that that's like, how do we, and the, and the federal government it gets thousands of acres every year in forfeiture for tax. People didn't pay their property taxes. Why is not that land being put into some land bank that the federal government could redistribute? I mean, we talked about 40 acres in a meal way back when. I mean, I remember vaguely this from my history classes. Why don't we give that land to beginning farmers who might be different than the white guy in a tractor? I mean, you know, we had more African-American farmers in Wisconsin back in the 1870s than we do now. You know, people were fleeing slavery in the South, came up to Wisconsin, set up, we had whole communities in the Driftless of African-American farmers in the 1860s, 1870s. What happened to them? Why did we decide that our farming system should be so monocultural, homo homogeneous? How did that happen? You know, and we, we and, and I mean, I, I, we have all these Afghan immigrants coming to Wisconsin right now, fleeing a war situation. I can tell you right now, a lot of them are good farmers who would love to get a piece of land, along with all the Latino immigrants that are here, the Somali immigrants, the Hmong immigrants. I mean, these, these are farmers coming here, like my ancestors from Ireland in the 1870s due to a, 1860s due to a famine. I mean, these people know how to farm. Give them some land, let them farm. I mean, why, why is farming denigrated and devalorized in this country? Why is it okay to import all this food from other places and say farmers are a bunch of losers? I mean, I was told, I mean, I mean talk to any rural kid who wants to go into farming. Why is this such a bad thing to do? Why is growing food such a bad thing or caring about the earth? Why is that like such a dumb thing to do? I mean, I have, I have rural kids in my econ class at Madison College who have internalized this type of self-deprecation. I mean, I, I'm trying to encourage them. You should be a farmer. You have skills, you care about the earth, you wanna grow good food for people. I mean, that's a, that's a valuable thing for our society. And I mean, this is one of our challenge with federal and state policy. Why, why are we promoting the factory farms Lynn's talking about rather than rotational grazing operations? Why are we promoting soy and corn, bean, corn cultivation versus you know, vegetables, which people can actually eat? Um, that's, that's a policy debate. That's, I mean, we're, and we're all citizens. I mean, you know, this is a big debate I have with my students too. You are not just consumers. You don't just vote with your dollar at the store. You are citizens, you are taxpayers, you are multifaceted people in this food system. You have lots of ways to weigh in on this and change this debate and make things better. And you know, that's, that's you know, we, we all have an interest in this. I mean, climate change is gonna affect all of us, it already is. So how do we shift agriculture to be a more climate friendly, you know, eco-friendly, socially just, equitable. I mean, this just transition is what, what we're really interested in. How do we bring about a just transition in our food farm system? You know, living wages for workers, you know, parity prices for farmers, climate-friendly practices, all that's all part of the agenda. Thanks very much. I, I, I do have one other thing to say with yes. that. 
that, uh, you know, the one thing that we're kind of missing on this is our university system. You know, mm -hmm. the universities, uh, they're promoting the very agriculture that we're, we're saying needs to change. You know, there is a far bigger, you know, even down at UW-Madison, the majority of agriculture down there is promoting the very system that is de destroying our, our climate and our, our ecology. You know, we need to shift our education away from chemicals and shift it to the, the very sustainable things that we're talking about here. You know, it shouldn't be a small portion. It should be the only portion that goes to how are we going to ecologically farm and save the planet? You know, back in the 1930s, the best and the brightest were the ones that went into agriculture. You know, now, like John's saying, and it's the same thing I heard as a kid, you know, if you can't do anything else, you can farm. You know, that, that's not the mentality that we need to be, be promoting. And, you know, the universities are, should be at the forefront of promoting the agriculture that's going to save the planet. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Norma, you've been waiting very patiently. We have just enough time to have a short question from you. So I will ask you to unmute and then I will invite John and Lynn to respond, have any um, concluding remarks, uh, and then I will uh, close us out uh, for the evening. Hello, everybody. Uh, I have been studying this kind of thing, well, mainly most of my life, but in the past 20 years, they came out with a uh, public broadcasting system uh, presentation that they had on tape that I immediately bought and cried to a lot because it's so beautiful. Uh, Symphony of Soil. Uh, I learned, uh, and I sent the... Uh, address of the man who planted trees. I put it into the chat. And of course, what it is, is a story. It's in, I think it was in Norway or someplace in the way north uh, that he just planted trees and changed the whole environment to the point where clear water was running down. He put his hands into the water and showed you that he could drink it. Um, but um, China, the Less Valley, L-O-E-S-S, -S, has been reclaiming land there through farming and uh, just general restoration of, of the land. Worth saying like a prayer uh, because it is so inspiring to know that this is what we can do. Uh, there's also, I'm just getting ready to get, uh, finally found an address for it. I asked for land reclamation and they keep giving me creating land out of offshore land. And I don't want to do that. I, I've heard that in Niger. And that's what I'm going to try and send you uh, uh, an address for in the chat. They've been reclaiming land through farming. I want to see us thinking that farming can reclaim the land. Farming would be a labor intensive activity. It would stop being this one person out there with a bunch of machinery. It would be small plots of whatever you want to grow, including livestock, which I'm told can dig up the soil on its own without a machine and also fertilize it at the same time. Norma, I hate to jump in here. Um, can I? Can I just? Can I just? It, it's you. You don't really want to just cut it off because what this is is the idea of what we're trying to do, which is to create small farms everywhere for a lot of people to get together and operate it. And if it's called sub, well, of course, this means cutting into the U.S. military's budget and uh, following the ideas that I've advocated at the beginning of my entry into this chat, uh, which is socialist, which is us taking care of us all instead of making profit for our owners here on their damn plantation. Thank you, Norma. John, Lynn, a comeback on that. Any comments, but any concluding remarks uh, so that I can close this out? I 
I, I would say that, you know, we, we all need to be looking at for food sovereignty and, and really each and every one of us can be doing that. That's, uh, you know, most of our ancestors came to this country because they were starving where they, where they were at and didn't have access to land. You know, we came here because we wanted to be able to grow our own food. You know, and I think that is one of the solutions that we need to look at is each and every one of us, whether you live in a city or you live in a rural area, if you're growing your own food, you're actually contributing to the change that is needed for the future. So that's, uh, you know, and I think that the one, in conclusion, I think, you know, the one thing that we all need to understand is we need to take action, you know, there, Greta Thunberg has, has said, you know, that she goes to all of these things and all she hears is blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, unfortunately, a lot of meetings doesn't change things. It's, it gets your information, it gets you everything that you, you know, for your mind, but it takes the action, each and every one of us, whatever it is, you know, that action is going to amplify and make it so that we're all better off. So I think we need to all start taking those actions. Uh, you know, John and I, we try to do it on a daily basis. Uh, hopefully everybody that's listening will, and we'll start doing more, more action in, in the future. So I thank you for having me tonight. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, that's Great, Lynn. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, part of part of the challenge is like, I mean, we, we can do this in all different levels. So, I mean, a lot of people think, well, we need to go to the UN Climate Change Summit. Well, I'll admit I went to one in 2009 in Copenhagen. It was a pretty depressing event. So um, we can try to, you know, change things at the federal level, international level. But I mean, I think a lot of work needs to be done at the state and local level. So, I mean, what we can do here will hopefully amplify and bubble up into federal policy. And I mean, you know, part of the, you know, just to remind people, I mean, a lot of this work is being done by indigenous people here. A lot of this work is being done by farmers of, you know, women of color in the global South. I mean, we're not alone in this. I mean, we're sort of in the belly of the beast. So I know I can go, I know it gets a little depressing. I mean, I, I bang my head against congressional doors all the time trying to get things done, but we're not alone in this struggle. So, I mean, that's one thing to think about too. I mean, the climate change issue affects everyone. So, I mean, just talking to your neighbors about, gosh, why are we having all this flooding? Geez, wouldn't it be nice if we planted more trees? I mean, why is all of this soil eroding off this cornfield? I mean, you know, why aren't there more cows out on the grass, like with a little red barn, like our license plate shows? I mean, what happened to them? I mean, those, those type of conversations get people to think about, gosh, we could do more, you know, here locally or at our state level about dealing with climate change. And, and agriculture is a big part of it. I mean, you think about how people connect with each other. And I would say food. I mean, that's why we call it agriculture, not agribusiness. I mean, it's a relationship between people about food. And people want to eat food that has good karma. Food that's you know, I mean, I think about the best food experiences I've had. And they don't involve mass-produced industrial corporatized food. It's not a, <laughs> it's not some microwave dinner I got out of the quick trip. That's not a good food experience. It's like a recipe my grandmother shared with me that I made from scratch involving local ingredients. And it probably doesn't have a climate change impact that's hurting our planet. I mean, that, I mean, think about that. So, I mean, go to the farmer, when you go to the farmer's market this year, and I hope everybody on this call goes to a farmer's market, talk to the farmers there about this. Why are they doing what they're doing? I bet 90% I bet will say, because I care about the planet. And part of why, what I'm doing, why I'm, I sell at the farmer's market is I care about the earth. I mean, this is Earth Week. John Muir's birthday is on Friday. Um, you know, that's, that's what should be motivating us. You know, it's not just like, I want to be cheap, fast, and easy. No, no, no. That's not, that's not going to save our planet. So I, I hope people, you know, going forward from this, that people think about, you know, everything you do makes a difference. Be intentional about whether you're a consumer, a citizen, a taxpayer, a voter, whatever motivates you. And, and you know, your food does, does have an impact on the climate and what type of system we, how we grow our food makes a difference. So more farmers, less clean greenhouse gases. <laughs> That would be a great agenda for 2022. <laughs>
So thanks. put it on a bumper sticker. Um, yep. I would say that I hope that you all continue to join us uh, in, in exploring um, environmental issues. Again, next week on April 27th on Wednesday, we are having Jennifer Booley, Dana Chernis, and Mark Sloshberg lead a discussion about another environmental issue, water. Rivers End, California's latest water war. What happens in California might not stay in California. So this is something that we can discuss here and now together. And we really encourage you uh, to come out for that. Again, check out the Havens Rights Center website for more details. I want to thank so much John E. Peck from Family Farm Defenders and Lynn Utesh of the Guardians of the Field Farm for joining us this evening, sharing their experiences, their wisdom, um, and their reflections tonight. And uh, thanks to all of you for uh, coming out. Uh, we'll see you again real soon. So please take good care. <laughs>